Hello um, everyone and a very warm welcome. I'm Georgina Wright and I'm the head of the Europe programme at the Institut Montaigne um, in Paris. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning for our second event in today's EU-UK forum, though slightly daunting, uh, coming after Vice President Shevkovich. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Kelly Beaver, Managing Director of Public Affairs at Ipsos Mori. I've had the pleasure of listening to Kelly more than once and I'm very excited to find out what what, um, her latest data is telling us about the UK EU relationship. So before we start some very quick housekeeping rules. So Kelly will begin um, with an overview of the data um, and then we will open up for uh, questions. Um, please do submit a question um, and I will make sure I ask it. Um, but without further ado, Kelly, I'm going to pass to you. Let's get the discussion underway. Thank you very much, Georgie. Brilliant to be with you all again. So we've been working with Paul and his team to understand public opinion over the last year or so, building on work that we've been doing for a number of decades, actually looking at relationships between the UK and the EU. If you just flick to the next slide, I'm going to start sharing with you some of the data that we've collected, some of it very fresh and new just of June this year, uh, and some of it back to uh, March time. But ultimately, how do the British public perceive Brexit in terms of order of importance of issues to British society today? And this chart, um, you might recognise it from the last event I did with slightly updated data. This is where, where the public place it. So it has dropped by level of public concern since earlier this year. And you can see that at the back end of the chart, the red line is the EU and Brexit. Uh, and you can see it is dwarfed by issues now such as the COVID-19 pandemic and coming secondary to the economy and the NHS. Um, and why is this? Why are the British public becoming less concerned about Brexit when it is clearly something that is still ongoing? Just flick to the next slide and you'll be able to see why. So this data is from March this year and people haven't really noticed an impact of Brexit on their lives still. Uh, this is a question we've asked a couple of times now. Six in ten say this, they've seen no impact. Three in ten say it's been a negative impact. And then when we ask them, OK, so if you haven't seen an impact yourself personally, what about somebody you know? What about somebody and their job or their business? And only a quarter say that somebody they know personally has had their job or business affected. So who are these individuals, though, who think that they have seen an impact personally to date? Well, they do tend to be younger. They tend to be graduates. They tend to have voted Remain. They tend to also have voted Labour at the end of 2019. Um, and so there's a very uh, specific build of characteristic who do perceive there to have been an impact to date. Next slide, please. But we don't think that Brexit is over yet. And this is quite consistent in the trends that we've been looking at over the last year. If you flick to the next slide, you'll see that around just over two in 10 people say that they think that there are still lots more negotiations to take place over the next few years, loads of issues left to finalise, comparatively to those who think that everything is now decided and there's going to be hardly any change, with just around one in seven perceiving that to be the case. And then we have this middle group of around a quarter who think we've got some of the outline around Britain's future relationship with the EU determined, but there are some really important areas where things are still left to be decided. And if you flick to the next slide, you can have a look at how the public think Brexit is going so far. So this is interesting actually, because when I presented um, to the EU UK forum back in March, we were seeing a real bounce in public opinion around Brexit as a result of the vaccination programme, but that was relatively short lived. And now we have again, more people perceiving there to have been a negative impact of Brexit than a positive impact. And you can see that switch over in and around the March and April period. And it didn't last very long, despite the potential impact of that vaccination program on people's perspectives. Next slide, please. And there has been a, a lot of conversation um, of dinner tables all across the UK about what people's Brexit identities were between the point of the referendum vote being called and ultimately for years after. Do you consider yourself to be a leaver? Do you consider yourself to be a remainer? And there was debate around whether those identities would really transcend and we would still be seeing them five years on. And the truth is that we are still seeing them. And if you flick to the next slide, we're still seeing people identify as a remainer or a lever 
more so than they would identify as, say, Conservative Party or Labour Party. Those political identities seem to have subsided in place of the Brexit identities. But we have seen them soften somewhat uh, since 2012 and even in the last couple of years where we've seen a more substantive uh, softening. So you can see here the data in this chart. The dark blue is the data from 2019 two years later, 2021. And those identifying very strongly as a Remainer or Lever has dropped by around 20%. So that, that's interesting in itself, but it's not to say it's gone away. And if you flick to the next slide, you can see how Leave and Remain feel about the, the opposition or those from the other side of the Brexit debate. And there is still a significant, uh, there hasn't been any change here really in people feeling cold or negative towards those from the other side of the debate. This is a feeling thermometer you can see. And if you look down the bottom, you can see for the right hand side, how Leave supporters feel about Remain supporters. And on the left, how Remain feel about Leave. And down in that bottom little bracket that I've highlighted, you can see that there's been no real shift towards people feeling warmer towards those who voted the other way in 2016 in the last two years. So that is still very much in play. But of course, it is very binary just to talk about leave and remain. And it doesn't really tell you the whole picture. And it is quite lazy in many ways just to stick to those labels. And so on the five year anniversary of the referendum vote, we conducted some more segmentation work to better understand how people's values underpin their identities. And if you flick to the next slide, you can see the seven tribes of Brexit in 2021. So this is our attempt at trying to get a more nuanced understanding of how the British public actually perceive their identities and how that fits with the Brexit identity. On the left hand side, you have those groups and tribes of people who would identify more strongly with Remain. And on the right hand side, you have groups and tribes who more strongly feel an identity towards leave. And in the middle, and this is really important, in the middle, there are three groups where their Brexit identity is actually not that strong. And they have they are still very much undecided about how things are feeling around Brexit and how the government are doing. So just to walk you through these tribes in more detail before I before I go on. On the left, so we have our liberal remainers. These are our most strongly affiliated with the Remain camp and they're very culturally liberal. They do tend to be graduates. They tend to be higher income. And for them, there have been absolutely no positives to date that they have seen from Brexit. Next to them, you have our anxious Remainers. Now, they're still pro-Remain, but they're culturally a bit more moderate and they're quite pragmatically motivated. So for them, they can see that there have been some positive outcomes from Brexit to date. On the far right hand side, then you have the other end of the spectrum, our traditionalist leavers. So they are most strongly affiliated with their leave identity and very culturally conservative. This group tend to be non-graduates, older, located in the Midlands and the north of England. And for them, there has been no downside from Brexit to date. They can't see any negatives. If you move inwards a little, you have our globalist leavers. So they are pro-leave, but they're also pro-globalisation and they're most on economics, on economics, they tend to be more right wing. This group for them, they can see some downsides of Brexit and they can they can see a bit more of a balanced picture. Now in the middle, these, these are three groups, which you can see is quite a big group of people actually who haven't got that strong sense of uh, Brexit identity. Firstly, our young middle Britons. So these do tend to lean remain um, and to have some form of Brexit identity, but it's not particularly strong. Um, and for this group, they tend to be younger working Britons of average income and more likely to be female than male. Then are politically disengaged in the centre. They are disengaged with Brexit, with politics. They don't really engage with it at all. Um, and they have very weak Brexit identities. They tend to be younger again, income, lower incomes, lower social grades, and again, slightly more likely to be female and then are entrepreneurially young. These are more likely to be male. They're a very small group, but actually we thought it was worth segmenting them out as a separate group. They're economically right wing. They don't really strongly identify with leave, but they're more pro leave than they are pro remain. Um, and as I say, they tend to be men. So you can see that there are quite a lot of differences even within the groups. And if you flick to the next slide, 
this is how these tribes start to look when you plot them against their economic value system. But also we know the cultural value system was incredibly important and the more emotional sides of things uh, from the Brexit vote itself. And what's important from this side is that actually the Remain and the Leave groups, they divide amongst themselves on cultural and economic values. Uh, for example, liberal Remainers, they're more liberal, more left wing, and our anxious Remainers are more moderate. And on things like political correctness, they actually have very different views. So 64% of the Liberal Remain group would say that they think political correctness is a good thing um, compared to only 16% of anxious Remainers who think that's the case. So there's big differences there between that Remain group. And then if we look at our Leave side and the traditionalist Leavers versus our globalist Leavers, um, they really have differences on opinion on things like the mix of people in my area makes it more interesting and enjoyable to live there. Globalist leavers are much more likely to agree with that sentiment than those traditionalist leavers. And of course, we can also see people from opposite sides of the debate having a very similar values alignment. For example, those who are traditionalist leavers would have something in common with our anxious remainers. They both are more likely than their counterparts to think that things are better in the past. And of course, on globalization, which is a really important uh, which is a really important concern, we see our liberal Remainers much more aligned with our globalist leavers than they are with the, their own counterparts in the Remain camp on things like uh, globalisation is good for Britain. So you cannot just look binary at leave, remain. The value system that under, underpins people's beliefs around this is actually quite complex. Um, and if you flick to the next slide, you can see it also starts to impact on what they want from the relationship in future with the EU. And that'll be incredibly important for government to understand as they continue with the negotiations. Next slide, please. So the top priorities for Britons as a whole has remained very similar to last year when we asked this question. It's about trade, trade, trade. Striking a trade agreement to make it easier to buy and sell goods and services with the EU, that hasn't changed. But beneath the surface of that top order priority for the British people, you can see that there are some differences. For example, in July 2020, coordinating on the COVID-19 pandemic response was considered to be important to the public. That has dropped off altogether by way of public concern. And if you flick to the next slide, you can see also differences between what's important for our leave camp and our remain camp. And of course, as I just explained, even within those camps, there are quite quite a lot of differences in opinion of what's important. Top for both is around trade, but secondary for our Remain voters is really looking at those bigger societal issues like climate change and working with the EU to reduce the impacts of climate change and protecting the environment. Comparatively with Leave voters, where the second order priority, very close to their top order priority of trade, is actually around illegal immigration and working with the EU to reduce that coming into Britain. Next slide, please. And we've been looking at how important people think the relationship with the UK and the EU is for some time now, for, for many, many, many years. And this has always been considered important at an overall level. This time, for this, this particular data with Paul and the team at the EU-UK forum, we asked about how important do you think it is for the UK and how important do you think it is for the EU? Who's got more skin in the game? Who, who's it more important for? And actually, you see that when we ask, is it important for the UK? The majority, nine, nine and ten, would say that it's either very or fairly important across, irrespective of, of how you voted, it's, all, it's almost as high. Remain voters more likely to have a strong sense that it's very important for the UK to maintain that good relationship. And if you flick to the next slide, you can see people's perceptions of how important is it for the EU to maintain a good relationship with the UK. And it's less, um, slightly less strong across the population of of feeling here. But again, almost uh, nine and 10 who would say it's important for the EU as well to be maintaining this relationship with the UK uh, and remain voters more likely to see that as important. And again, that strength of feeling around very important for the EU comes out more strongly for those who voted remain. Next slide, please. And then we asked some open questions just to get people's perspectives of what they think the benefits are going to be. And the benefits um, for the UK from leaving the EU, largely around control, control and freedom to make your own laws, 
um, to set border c controls and immigration. Trade comes out very strongly as well. Uh, and of course, uh, things like independence and sovereignty, you can see beneath the surface. And if you go to the next slide, you can see some of the risks that people perceive that the UK is running uh, now as a result of exiting the EU. Trade comes out strongly, but also concerns around the economy, food prices, travel and isolation. And if you go to the next slide, I think it's interesting isolation comes out as an issue because actually, if you flick on, you can see uh, how whilst you know, Britain is actually quite optimistic uh, about its future role in the world and doesn't want to be, the UK doesn't want to become isolationist. Not everybody's convinced. And if you flick to the next slide, you can see the differences here in those who voted leave and remain. But more people across the UK would, if they look 20 years into the future and they think about what our reality will be, they're more likely to say that Britain will be global Britain, a country that plays its role in the world, than they are likely to say Britain's going to be a small island with very few other countries paying attention to, to Britain. There are differences of opinion. Um, Remain are more likely to feel that it will be a small island than global Britain and leave more likely to say uh, that will be global Britain with an important role in the world. So you can just see some of the challenges that remain in British society as the government seek to negotiate further uh, and reach conclusions. So next slide, please. And final slide. Just some takeaways. Brexit hasn't gone away. We haven't seen the effects of it yet necessarily. Some of the COVID impacts will have watered down people's ability to understand what's Brexit versus what's COVID. Um, the perceptions of how it's going is very anchored still in people's Brexit identities and their views of the world. And then thirdly, trade is the top priority, but it's not the only priority that people are going to judge Brexit on. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. That was um, brilliant, exhaustive, but comprehensive. Um, I have a series of questions I was jotting down frantically um, and a couple of questions have come in as well. Um, but maybe I can, you know, start with one question which which kind of relates to something you said at the beginning. You know, people know Brexit has happened. Not everyone has felt the impact on their lives, but they don't think that it's over. Um, you know, what do you think would be the key factor or event that could change, uh, you know, people's minds about Brexit or perhaps the impact of Brexit? You know, what could trigger a shift in, in public opinion, in your view? So, uh, good question. I, I think uh, it's firstly worth reflecting on what what were the key things for people that, that drove decisions towards voting a particular way back in a referendum and changing people's minds isn't the issue, it's their hearts and their emotions and the cultural value system. That was a huge part in why people voted how they did. So I think there's a minds versus the hearts piece here. And um, the perception of success is very much in the eye of the beholder, as we see when we look at that data by remain and leave and how they perceive things are going. And we did have a massive success in March with that the vaccination programme. And you saw, even amongst the Remain camp, that there was a, a sort of sense that the UK was doing better as a result of being out of the EU and able to put in place its own vaccination programme. So that was, that was a big success, but that didn't last very long. And people very much have retreated back into their perceptions again, uh, which are very much linked to their identities. So I, I don't think that um, it will be a, I don't think there'll be a single thing that will change people's perspective of how things are going or indeed of uh, whether they will change their views on Brexit overall. These views aren't necessarily grounded in, in a, a sort of balanced logic. They are much more um, grounded in a, an emotional reaction. But I guess for the government, it's quite important to, to be mindful of, you know, would it be the, you know, suddenly food being much more expensive, or or would it be that you have to queue longer when you when you travel abroad, or you need you know the correct driving license, or you need to make sure you've got the right certificates for your pet if you want to take them on holiday? You know, is it those sorts of things? Because I guess you know, would people still be thinking, "Gosh, was this a good idea?" Or will now the emphasis be more on the government's handling of Brexit and what was promised? So, yeah, I think it's worth reflecting on what people what people see when we ask them about you know how. The, how do you perceive the, the handling of Brexit is going? So they don't see the inner workings on regulatory yeah. changes, what's going on in the negotiations. What they see is what impacts their daily lives. And to date, some of the impacts that will have been felt for the average person on the street 
they yet haven't they haven't yet seen that. So it will be in industries that are more defined, like fisheries, uh, transport in industries, where they will have felt the direct effects much more upfront, short term, and a, a relatively hard hit. That will eventually translate to things like food prices for people. And um, through our other data we collected with the EU UK forum back in March, we did see that people were anticipating food prices were going to rise, travel was becoming going to become more difficult into the EU. It didn't necessarily, those, those things were not necessarily triggering a we're absolutely terrified about what's to come reaction, but more mm. of a, uh, certainly amongst each of the camps, um, it was more of a, right, we recognise this, we anticipate this, this is something that we are likely to see. So government, yes, they should really focus on the things that the public will see en masse, um, at the minute, it's very much on those direct uh, effects that are hitting specific industries or lines of work. Um, but we will start to see it in the population as a whole when things do reopen for travel. Um, and of course, when we see some of the, the food price impacts really hit uh, in the UK, difficult to disentangle at this point between COVID and Brexit, of course. Great. I've got two questions coming in. But um, just just before we we go to the UK EU relationship, let's stick with with the government. And, you know, I guess my my question is, are there any aspirations about the future of the UK that all these tribes share? So put in put another way, I guess, if you were, you know, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, what policy would you, you know, actively pursue knowing that most Britons would actually support it? Does, does anything come out of the data? Is there anything that they're waiting for, they're hoping for? It's a, it's a good question. The British public, you'll have seen that from that first slide, have been very distracted over the last 12 to 18 months. And we've never seen an issue like COVID hit the issues index at that kind of level. Um, and so very much the eyes are on government from, hand, from a perspective of how you're handling COVID-19 at the minute. Brexit is definitely not a top order issue for them uh, in, their, in their mindset. What I would say is though, as we start to come into the back end of this year and we pray that the COVID pandemic starts to subside or at least be managed in some way, the public will perhaps turn their attention to some of the freedoms and the cooperation, the coordination that they had before that they may not sense in their daily lives. So if I was the government, I think putting all of those direct programmes in place that are directly hitting particular industries or sectors right now is really important, but making sure they keep an eye on what the public are feeling and what they're experiencing day to day and making sure that they adapt as they go along because um, that, if, from their perspective, it's all about being elected. Obviously doing a good job is incredibly important, but their electability um, mm. will be important for them to keep in mind as well. And there will be eyes eventually watching on how they've handled this. So we've got one question that came in that said, you know, we've talked about sort of some of the, the negative impact that people may have, but has there been any positive impact that the the, the date you know that people have felt that has been revealed by the data. Yeah, yeah. So the biggest thing, of course, was the handling of COVID nineteen. Not the lockdowns. The public didn't think that was a positive. Uh, the government didn't do better on the way they managed lockdowns, but they did on the vaccination program. And then beneath the surface of um, some of the concerns, you can see people. Uh, being able to bring in new laws and regulations, being able to negotiate free trade agreements with other other parts of the world, those those issues did come through, and that British sovereignty piece was really under the spotlight back in March. Um, and the trade deals actually they haven't got as much uh, coverage either with the British public or with the news, but it is still recognised as a positive outcome of Brexit to date. Great, and we we we've another. Um question from from John Pete, um, the political and Brexit editor from, from The Economist, who has said, you know, uh, is there any polling on whether voters blame the EU or the Johnson government about problems such as the Irish uh, sea border question? So obviously that didn't come up in in it because, you know, there's only so much you can cover in 10 minutes. But does the data reveal any of that? Who do they blame the Northern Ireland? Yeah, government? OK, so you you're going john really good question you're going into it with an assumption that people in england uh scotland and wales care about northern ireland and i'm from northern ireland but i care deeply but unfortunately anytime we ask about um northern irish issues on what i would refer to as uh, sort of mainland uh uk it, it isn't really a top concern for people and they they, they don't necessarily uh, see it as a big issue because it's not in there it doesn't feel like it's in their uh, back gardens, so to speak. So um, I think overall, the issues in Northern Ireland are very much felt in Northern Ireland. And 
uh, the Northern Irish people, if you were to ask them. And I think the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, I think Katie Hayward looks after that. Uh, they did look at some of the mm. sentiment in Northern Ireland, but overall on the, uh, I'd probably be shot for saying this, the mainland, um, they care much less about Northern Ireland and the issues um, uh, the average person on the street would care much less. And the EU UK forum had a great event on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I highly encourage you to watch back if you can. Um, sticking to sort of regional differences, we, we got a question from um, Catherine Meenan from the Institute of International and European Affairs um, in Dublin. So are you in a position to talk about geographical differences? You know, are there strong differences between sort of the way that Scottish voters feel versus, you know, versus Northern Ireland and well, so the data itself is GB, so it doesn't include Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey is the best source of information on how people in Northern Ireland feel. But we did break the data down by Scotland. And you do see, um, in the same way that Scotland was more Remain to begin with, you do see that feed through into the data as well. So more negative about um, handling of things, more negative about the outcomes, um, less likely to see positive benefit. Um, so there is a there is a difference in Scotland that has kept with how it was at the original referendum vote in many ways. Um, and if people are interested, we can send them a deck just on the, the Scotland uh, versus the average comparisons. Great, that's brilliant. So one question which you, you can just say, I don't have the data, but um, was, you know, we, we've looked a little bit at obviously what UK voters think, mm -hmm. um, but Rupert Wilkinson from, from the European Parliament says, you know, have you focused on, on what the EU wants, what EU voters, you know, want, and is that important, do you think? Uh, God, yes, it's important. Absolutely, it's important. Um, no, we haven't in this particular piece, but... Um, for the gentleman who asked about it, I think if we if we're able to do so the next time I present at the forum events, I think I would really like to have something um, which also gives that that perspective. Um, it is a, a bigger piece of work, but I think it would be really good to bring that perspective in and to see uh, to see how others around the, the EU feel about how the Brexit uh, saga is playing out. It's quite interesting sitting in Paris, at least. I, my my sense is that you know Brexit is really a non-issue. No one talks about it, um, even in January. As far as I'm line. Yeah, yeah. People had switched off um, long before the the negotiations mm. concluded, and it, it's very much the focus is on the EU and everything that you need sorted out there, and less the EU's uh, relations with with third countries like the UK. Um, conscious of time, we've got two minutes, Kelly. So I'm going to ask you two okay. questions. Um, okay. One is from Bobby. Mukduna, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly from Ireland, who says, you know, how do you interpret the surprising fact that so many people still prioritise a trade deal with the EU when there's already a trade deal on the table? Um, and then a question from Richard Barfield. Um, for those who did want to rejoin, um, which particular issues should they focus on uh, uh, when they're, you know, promoting EU membership and all the rest of it? So on trade, I think it's the conversation we're going to be having for a long time. And I know the broad uh, trade negotiations have been done, but you'll see from even just the basic press coverage that there are still conversations about little parts of that agreement on a really regular basis. So it's in the public psyche. So it's not a surprise to me that it comes up still as the top priority for the, for the British public. Um, and then on the question on how for those who are um, keen, I think you said, for a, a rejoin, I think a lot of the polling that's been done on public attitudes has been very coming out very similar to what it looked like in 2016. So there hasn't really been a seismic shift. I think we probably need to give it time to bed in to see what the actual impacts are for the country. Um, you know, we, we would, maybe we would have thought that something like a global pandemic would have made people rethink and what more extreme circumstance can you imagine than what we've been facing over the last year? And it still hasn't prompted a rethink and a shift in public opinion. Um, so I think probably in the f giving it time um, and seeing how things fall out um, um, is, is incredibly important. Thank you, Kelly. Right, I'm going to probably wrap up because there's a minute. I mean, I, I was struck that clearly Brexit isn't over, but I guess, and this is the point of the EU-UK forum, um, is to think uh, perhaps more constructively about the future relationship between the UK and the EU, because we saw climate change there, immigration, there are lots of issues that actually are of key concern to UK voters, but also to EU voters. And I suspect that going forward, there might be opportunities for the UK and the EU to work together on on 
areas of mutual interest. But always important to keep an eye on, on what voters think. Um, thank you very much, Kelly, um, for your That's presentation. True. And thank you to everyone for your questions. Um, there will be a, a brief break um, and then Anand and Paul will be back to give you an overview of the politics and what to expect next.